has to do with thinking, but it has to do with thinking coherently. And, uh, the, uh, the motto uh, of our institute, the Intercultural Development Research Institute, is coherent theory generates powerful practice. Coherent theory generates powerful practice. And since most of us in here are in one way or another practicing, and we are the choir, what will enable us to do what Lynn A. I thought so nicely talked about yesterday as to illuminate, that one of the things after we get our story straight is to illuminate. If we wish to illuminate something, illuminating it with a coherent light is much more intense than with incoherent light. That's what a laser does. That's why you can shoot a laser from the Earth and it illuminates only a 200 mile wide circle on the moon. Very intense beam. And I'd like to keep that metaphor for us as we talk about this this morning. That by honing our thinking and, by the way, our languaging about what it is that we are doing, we can make the light that we use to illuminate these ideas ever so much more coherent. And in so doing, I believe, intensify our practice. That's the purpose of this. And I'll now shift back into Descartian stuff. But nevertheless, but where, where it's going to go, I hope by the end of the 20 minutes, is to a place where when you go off to those groups, You'll, have, you'll be able to generate some ideas of things that we can actually do today, tomorrow, and, and, and do things. Let's, so let's start out with Descartes, um, the separation of mind and body. You all know, and this is perennial philosophy, that once you separate the mindful self from the body self, that we become victims of the reality that we have created. And this separation of mind and, 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 and body uh, has been exacerbated, really, by uh, the Industrial Revolution, by, the, by Newtonian physics, basically, which set out a reality, a clockwork reality, which was knowable in an objective sense. Think of the word objective, meaning to make an object of something. That that reality, that clockwork reality, was knowable in an objective way by an off a usually unstated omniscient observer, that's you, who has no role whatsoever but to passively bring in that absolute reality which exists outside of you despite whatever you might do or think. Here's, some, here's a, something I thought was kind of a nice statement about this. This is Beatrice Bruteau. I don't know if any of you remember her. She, she wrote in 1979, Theosophical Press. Some of you may know material from the Theosophical Press. And the book was called The Psychic Grid. It wasn't really about psychics at all. It was about how it is that we modulate our thinking about things. And here's a quote. It's a bit extensive, but I think it's worth it. The knowledge that we are conscious of the world makes us feel separated from the world. And pause there. The knowledge that we are conscious of the world makes us feel separated from the world because here we are being conscious. Okay. We regard it as an object and ourselves as the subject. This is why we expect the world to be outside of our consciousness. And we rely on this outsideness to give us security by putting us in an indubitable contact with the reality for which we are not responsible. But from another point of view, the image of the world being outside us is disturbing. It gives rise to a frightening sense of solitude and powerlessness. We are gripped by an insecure feeling that there are many things going on in the world which are hidden from us and beyond our control. We feel lost and anxious. Unable to live confidently with our own determinations of reality, we long for someone else, someone possessing authority, to tell us how it is with the world and what we must do to live safely. If we succumb to this craving, we will become willing to renounce our gift of freedom and to submit to whatever authoritative power will take over from us the responsibility for declaring that things are a certain way and that behavior must be a certain way. The feeling of uncertainty is thus purchased at the price 
of our special human quality of freedom. And we escape what we fear might be helplessness before the powerful universe by embracing what we know to be helplessness in obedience to authority. Our act of submission sweeps away the alternatives that would otherwise torment us and establishes certainty and reality. By making ourselves impotent, we believe we have made ourselves secure. Woo! Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Still in print, this book. <laughs> the psychic grid, so, you know, I, 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 you can buy used copies of it for one cent, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the point, of course, that I'm making here is that by abdicating our responsibility for the construction of the reality that we live in, we create this entity, we, we give reality to something, that in turn has the possibility of uh, victimizing us or of, of allowing us to victimize ourselves by trying to escape being victimized by that reality that's outside of our control. The process whereby this occurs is called reification. Reification, that is to give reality to something, to reify. And the term's been used by a number of people. I like the definition that uh, Berger and Luckman Sociologist, The Social Construction of Reality. It's one of those books that everybody, all sociologists anyway, know about it. Very few of them have actually read it. Uh, so you can quote it. <laughs> uh, so just in one of those insider academic things. Uh, but here, here's a quote I think is good. The institutional world is objectivated. A little bit of a constructed term there, but I think you get what he's talking about is objectivated human activity. And so is every single institution, like money. For those of you who were there last night, I, mean, I hope you're seeing the resonance now of this, the reification of money, right? In other words, despite the objectivity that marks the social world and human experience, it does not thereby acquire an ontological status apart from the human activity that produced it. Reification implies that man, people, are capable of forgetting their own authorship of the human world, and further, that the dialectic between people, the producers, and their products is lost to consciousness. That is, people are paradoxically capable of producing a reality that denies them. And so for those of you who were at the movie last night, that's, that was the story of money. The money was, the story of money, the reification of money is we have created an entity that denies us, <laughs> that no longer allows for us to be participating in the process that it originally symbolized. Another, right on. <laughs> <laughs> another, okay, okay. another, another great call and response is fine on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, another, another great example of this is Stephen Gould's work uh, called The Mismeasurement of Man. Um, another <laughs> somewhat you know, gender-specific term is used for a liberative purpose, as I suspect. But in any case, Stephen Gould uh, wrote this about intelligence, IQ. And he, talk, and, and he said, IQ is one of those wonderful examples where we measured something. But what we're really measuring is how people performed on certain tasks by a way for, by trying to, to, to um, predict how well they might do in school so as to organize the kind of schooling actually to create developmentally appropriate schooling. That was the purpose of the original measurements of IQ. However, what happened is the, there was a reification of the measurement category. So the thing that was being measured started being treated as if it were a thing, IQ. The G factor, essentially what it's called. And that G factor was then further not only thought to exist, but thought to exist inside of people. So now no longer do we talk about measuring somebody's activity, we talk about trying to find that thing that's inside of you. The reification of intelligence. Intelligence is not a thing. Just like reality is not a thing. And in my own work, um, I've, I've been fighting against the idea of culture as a thing. 
I think it's useful to talk about culture, just like it might be useful to talk about intelligence. But the moment that we treat culture as a thing, it allows us to do that kind of social Darwinist thing, which is to say, well, some people have it and other people don't. And the people who have culture are civilized. And the people who don't have culture are less civilized. If they're only a little bit less civilized, they're barbarians. And so we can save them. We can bring them civilization. It used to drive colonialism, now it drives imperialism. Nation building, we call it. <laughs> if, they're, if they're lower than barbarians, they're savages, and we can exploit them, because they're not really human. And what we mean by not really human is they don't have the stuff that we assume you need to have to be civilized. So this creates this kind of pyramidal structure of social Darwinism, which I'm sorry to say I think is still alive. I think we haven't gotten past the idea that we live in different experiences of reality, and that those different experiences of reality give us in fact, mean we have different ontological status, that you are different from me, you're not less complex than I am, but you live in a different reality than I do, both as a woman and just as another person. I think we're going through a paradigmatic transition. And the transition in physics terms is from Newtonian physics to quantum physics, but the in-between state is Einsteinian. And the translation of that into social science is uh, the idea of perspective, the idea of frame of reference. Einstein, as you, of course, all know, created the idea that we, uh, that we cannot know the universe in the absolute sense that, New that Newton suggested, but that we rather have a position, a speed, and a position relative to other things in the universe. And we can only know other things in the universe from that position. That's the idea of perspective. That's the idea of frame of reference. So as that has entered social science, it's now become fairly common, I think, for people to think that, you know, oh yeah, you have your perspective, I have my perspective. But we haven't quite made it into that transitional state. Never mind to the quantum state of riding the waves of probability, that's another whole story altogether. Are you going to New Zealand? He's going to New Zealand. Ah, okay. Sorry. I thought, well, we couldn't have a good trip. But, you know. He's just going to the bathroom. You know. <laughs> so what happens is we've sort of made it halfway into this perspectival reality, this notion that we live in different frames of reference, both culturally, uh, by gender, by socioeconomic class, and certainly even individually. We live in different contexts. Our experience of reality is different. Whether or not we think that there might be some reality out there, our perspective on that reality is limited to the part of the elephant that we can touch, you know, the six men of Hindustan who are much inclined to what is the elephant that all of them are blind. And what happens upon the wall that the side of the elephant says, my goodness, how much like a wall and the other on the tusk and says no, how much like a spear and the other on the tail and says no, no, it's like a rope. And these six men of Hindustan argued loud and long. All of them were right, though all of them were wrong. That's the relativity poll, right? And the idea, of course, is that they couldn't know anything about that elephant except where they were touching it. But the, other, the underlying assumption is there really was an elephant there. That's why this is a transitional state. Because current thinking is that there's no elephant there. But, that, you know. <laughs> but we're moving from the idea that if you just opened your eyes, you could see the elephant, to the idea that you only know the elephant, although there is an elephant, by touching it in some particular place. This has led to a situation that I'm calling multiple absolutes. And you see it a lot um, in uh, Fox News, for instance. <laughs> you know, but, but not just Fox News. MNBC, um, uh, in the USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. That in all of these media outlets and, and innumerable internet outlets, and blogs and other outlets as well, what you're seeing are people who are claiming that they have a perspective but simultaneously claiming that it's true. 
Can you hear it? Yeah. It's paradigmatic confusion. That rather than saying, here's my perspective, I understand you have a perspective that's different than this one. We may be touching the elephant in different places, but we think this is a good place to touch it, so let me tell you what that is. Instead of saying that, we're saying we have the true perspective. Yeah, it's a perspective, but it's the true perspective. This is paradigmatic confusion. This is using Newtonian thinking, which there is an absolute truth, and we could know it, and bringing it into Einsteinian reality, which is to say we can only touch part of the truth, but the part I'm touching is the best. <laughs> and, so, and so we're in trouble from that. I mean, this is creating a very chaotic social situation where people are fighting intractably with one another, intractably. And the reason is they are living in different realities, and they're not acknowledging that. They're not acknowledging that they're living in different realities. So the movement, I think the movement, the transition that we as the choir are trying to facilitate is the next one. We've got to deal with that. I mean, we have to be dealing with this notion of multiple absolutes. But I think the reason for dealing with that is not to settle into an Einsteinian perspectival ontology but rather to move ourselves into something that's closer to what in physics would be called a quantum reality, but which in social science is generally called constructivist, a constructivist paradigm. And the idea of a constructivist paradigm is that we are in the process of creating our experience. It kind of leaves aside the idea of whether there really is a reality or not of any particular kind. People like Heinz von Furster or, or Ernst von Glasser's felt these are some of the promulgators of, uh, of, uh, of constructivism, say the issue is not whether our experience matches reality, it's whether it fits reality. Mm. And by fitting reality, it means there are lots of ways that we could be that fit reality. There may be a few that don't. For instance, I suggest that no matter how much you believe that we're constructing reality, that you not go stand in front of a locomotive and say, we're just constructing this. <laughs> True, but others have constructed it in such a way as to be able to kill you. <laughs> and, and, and probably they're stronger than you are collectively, right? So don't do it. Also, I would discourage you from like launching yourself off of a roof with the notion that since we're only constructing ourselves, we could construct ourselves to fly. Because uh, as Umberto Matoyana, some of you may know him, a biologist, has said that who we are and who the world is, is a function of co-ontological drift. That we generate, <laughs> great term, isn't it? Co-ontological drift. Uh, it's, it's kind of an, it's an alternative to the teleological uh, evolution. You know, that somehow evolution is moving in some particular direction towards some particular end. Well, who says? Well, we say, oh, so you're constructing that, you know, process. So he's, so sort of to, to, to move out of that uh, construction, he's saying, we are in this condition where we are generating the environment, but the environment, of course, is constraining us. But as we are constrained, we also are generating the environment. And so, and moving back and forth, we maintain this um, ontological drift, co-ontological drift. And of course, this, this, this is perennial philosophy. This is the idea that we're all connected. This is the idea that if we, if we look at, at our separation from reality and move slightly beyond that, we see the connection of all of us as human beings and of us and the environment. However, I'd like to suggest that it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. It's not just that we're all connected. It's easy, or I think it's too easy, to say that's the absolute reality. That this empirical reality is the ephemeral one, but in fact the transcendent reality, the platonic reality, that's the real one. And so we surrender ourselves into that reality without taking responsibility for the construction of that reality as well. <laughs> We are creating transcendent reality every bit as we, uh, much as we are creating our everyday experiential reality. Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote a book, amongst many, he's a natural uh, uh, language philosopher, 
and he wrote a book called uh, Tractatus Logicus Philosophicus. <laughs> it's a book about him. Yeah, so he's nodding his head. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Some people actually read that book. And it's a book of logic, basically. And at the end of the book, there are the famous two lines that almost all of you have heard, which is, which are, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one should remain silent. Right? And they come at the end of this very this long book of logic. Let me tell you the two lines that precede those lines. Very interesting, illuminating, I think. The two lines that precede that are everything that logic I have described in this book is capable of, of, of explaining everything in the world, save for one thing. And that is the feeling of the world thus described. <laughs> Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one should remain silent. So what that silence refers to is not the apprehension of an absolute reality. It's the participation in the feeling of the world thus construed, the world thus defined, the world as constructed. And so there is something beyond our separate experience, but that thing which is beyond our separate experience is the feeling for the whole of our collective experience. That's defined. And, and of course we know how that works. You know, we, know, we know that we don't have direct sensory apprehension of, of the empirical reality around us. We know that that, that our visual senses, for instance, are a function of the interaction of the cells in our retina, and that the, 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 the light stimulation that we are perceiving to be out there, in fact, is simply, the, is simply stimuli that are created by any interaction of cells within several layers of our retina. The same thing is going on in the cochlea of your ear. And we know, I think it's pretty common knowledge now amongst physiologists and, 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 and neuropsychologists, that, that, our, that our physical experience is not a direct apprehension. It is a construction, clearly a construction. The extension that I think we need to make is that the products of our consciousness are equally a construction. That what it is that we do that we cannot apprehend in absolute reality. What we can do is to have a feeling for the reality that's construed. And the reason that I want to, that I want to uh, stress that is that it makes us responsible. There is no escaping the responsibility, going back now to the Brutal quote. There is no escaping the responsibility. Not, never mind the empirical reality. There's no escaping the responsibility for transcendent reality. There's no escaping the responsibility for creating our spiritual path. Not finding it, creating. There's no escaping the responsibility of finding true love. You're not finding it, you're creating it. There is no escaping responsibility for yourself by discovering your true self. You're creating it. So by being coherent, and, and I know most of you are not in your heads here because I don't think what I'm saying is antithetical to the way that you're feeling and the way people are talking about events here at, at the gathering. But how we package that into a coherent philosophy for ourselves, I think, is, is meaningful. It, 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 it generates the coherence necessary for us to operate effectively. So here are some uh, kind of practical implementations of this. And these are just my suggestions. I'd like for you to come up with some others, but you know, here are three of them. One of them is stop reifying language. In, in English, it's easy for us to reify things because English is set up as an objective language. English is set up to create objects, objects and subjects. We can't just say raining, we have to say it's raining. What? What's raining? It. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is that it? Yeah, well, that's the object that's generating the action, you know, of rain. Not true, by the way, in Hopi language. In Hopi language, you can say raining, and you don't have to say what it is that's raining. It's just raining. You know. Hopi, by the way, also makes you uh, add a qualifier. This is Benjamin Lee Wharf now. It makes you add a qualifier that says how certain you are of what you're saying. 
<laughs> so the grammatical structure says, I myself have been in the rain and I, and, it, and rain and rainy. <laughs> As opposed to I heard somebody say rainy. <laughs> yeah, so it might be handy. So, so add an I so so here's one suggestion. Add an I and G to everything. Not language, but languaging. We're here we're, we're languaging. Uh, not government, but governing. Not abortion, but aborting. Not gun control, but controlling guns. So we we're doing, and, and each time we put the ing on that, we create responsibility. And we don't have to. We don't have to make put the it in there, because another good thing to possibly do is to avoid the word is. The general semanticists, who are some people who dealt with this early on, uh, said the most dangerous word in the English language is is. <laughs> is. <laughs> because is generates the reality. He is bad. So let's avoid saying it is bad, but to say something like, you can come up with something better than this, I think, but it does not serve the purpose that we are wishing for. It does, or, or even more, uh, a little more definitively, it does not fulfill our definition of goodness. So when we say something's bad, we're not really, I mean, I'm sure you'd all agree when I say this, we're not really referring to it being bad by any sort of absolute standard, if you've been following this philosophical position here. We're saying it doesn't fit our definition of goodness. It falls outside of that definition, and therefore it is bad. Well, that's okay. We, we can't say that, and we should say that. But we should say it with responsibility. We should say we take responsibility for our definition of goodness, and that isn't. <laughs> and that falls outside of that, just to, to make it more active. Same thing with goodness. To say something is good from this rendering is to say, I am committed to this path. To say this is a good direction to go is really to say, I am committed to this path. This is something that I want to do. So, may I suggest to you that there are some other things that you might... Oh, one, one last suggestion. Never say, I had no choice. <laughs> so as to avoid that victimization that Beatrice Pateau said. Right? Well, that's the end of my...